Дорога українська громада, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to our Ukraine house. On this very special occasion, November is a sad month for all of us Ukrainians. And today with opening the ceremony, we are starting our Holodomor month. And this exhibition, Holodomor through the eyes of Ukrainian artists, 1932-1933, is consist, consists of paintings that have been selected for this exhibition and belong to the private collection of our longtime friend and partner, Morgan Williams the head of USUBC, and dedicated to the most painful page of Ukrainian history, the great famine genocide that was imposed on our people and our country by communist regime during two horrible years. It was an attempt not just to take our bread away, but essentially to uh, snuff out all of the resistance and pressure our people to forget that we want to live on our own land, that we want to make our own choices, that we want to make our civilizational choices, to be who we are, to be very peaceful bread growers, but also govern our own lives. The figures are horrible. We all know that different estima estimates give us 7 to 10 million. 7 to 10 million sounds horrible, but if you think about terms of days or months and put it in this perspective, it sounds even more horrendous. In June 1933, at the height of Holodomor, the Ukrainian villagers were dying at the rate of 34,560 per day, which is 1,440 per hour, or 24 per minute. This is difficult even to imagine, but it happened. Among the children, one of three actually died during these two years. Imagine this. There are tragic similarities, unfortunately, about what was going on in 1932 and 33, and what our country goes again through now. Because since 2014, we are again fighting to be able to do the same civilizational choice. And this time, we're doing it better. Because the difference is how the United States, Europe, how the collective West, how our partners and friends react to it. Mm -hmm. 88 years ago, the loss of millions of innocent lives was silenced. And obviously, it was one more crime of the regime. Not only we lost millions, we couldn't even mourn them. We couldn't even talk about them. Our grandparents were afraid to tell us the stories. Only after Ukraine became independent, only after we started opening up, then in whispers. They started telling us the stories. And then these whispers became louder. And now we can be very loud, not only in spreading the truth as the tribute to those who died, but also spreading the truth to hold everyone accountable. And something that we have to do now also, to hold Russia accountable for what they're doing right now to our people. So it's time to call the crime by its name. That's why we are very grateful to all of the Ukrainian Americans who are fighting together as a big team Ukraine to actually call it what it is, to call it a genocide, and uh, to remind everyone what it is, but also to fight for Ukraine now. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would not want to be very long. This is one of the first events, but definitely not the last one, that we will have in November devoted to Holodomor. I would like to thank personally to Morgan Williams, thank you Morgan, that during 1997-2000 in Ukraine you collected more than 250 original artworks by Ukrainian artists and together with US UBC team took great efforts to present some of this collection here in Washington DC. It's a small portion. I also would want to mention and thank for the contribution of so many members of our Ukrainian community, Gromada, for providing, like you can see around here, a beautiful embroidery, pottery, Asian portraits, all brought here to create the atmosphere of 1930s in, in Ukraine. I also would want to thank my team, the team of the Embassy of Ukraine, but also Ukraine House. Thank you very much. 
I know how hard you work to put it all together. And of course, uh, our heart goes to Naira Oborska, who baked sour bread using the Asian recipe. We will not have a reception today, but we will have the bread and water so that we can, you know, share the Ukrainian bread. And it's uh, baked by Naira for the special occasion today. November is the month of commemorating the whole of the Mort, and Washington has played an incredible role in bringing to the world's attention this great tragedy. This is where in the 80s, uh, in the early 80s, the commission, Congressional Commission worked. This is where the beautiful monument of the Washingtonian Larissa Kurilas uh, speaks, speaks to all who who pass by the by this very fine and subtle uh, sign of what happened in Ukraine, and this is where we have dynamic ambassadors uh, and a dynamic community that uh, speaks to all people who come to the capital of the world. It is a sad commemoration. And we pray and work and study and share this story so that nothing like this happens again. That the genocidal history of the 20th century, the Armenian genocide, the Holocaust, the Cambodian genocide, what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Ukraine where there were different waves of genocide of which the Holodomor was the worst, that this not happen again. And yet we see autocrats and tyrants uh, and power-hungry politicians uh, trampling people. Uh, and it's happening in Ukraine as we speak. There is this commemoration of the tragedy and the struggle against evil. But there also is a victory of life. Those of us who were in Washington in the 80s or 90s who lobbied for the Holodomor or came for protests, we cannot but rejoice that there is an embassy of free, free Ukraine and that we're celebrating 30 years of life, of Ukrainian independent life. The Holodomor, more than any other event right now, unites global Ukrainians. I just you know, moved from Paris, where we filled up Notre Dame every year before it burned, uh, commemorating the Holodomor. On the 27th, we're going to be in St. Patrick's in New York. Last week, we were in Philadelphia in our cathedral. All over the world, we come together commemorating but we are in fact also celebrating our life and our future. And uh, let, this, let this be a strong moment of unity. Uh, let no issue divide the question of the Holodomor. And let us really in great respect for life, God-given life, continue to work together and build. I thank everybody that has contributed here, uh, Madam Ambassador Morgan, your staffs, and this dynamic Washington community. Uh, you make us all proud. God bless you all. enemy, only one solution was possible. They would have to be starved out. The preceding statement describes a conclusion about the Ukrainian famine genocide or Holodomor from the Black Book of Communism, a book 
that illuminated the unspeakable horrors of communist tyranny worldwide. For decades in Ukraine, the Holodomor, Stalin's genocide, which took the lives of between 7 to 10 million Ukrainians by starvation, was spoken of only in whispers, if at all. There was no mention of it in newspapers or history books or even memoirs. How did the Soviet Union accomplish this? By using the communication channels of the era, they created fake news. But imagine if you would, the greater Washington DC metropolitan area, a population of approximately 6.4 million people, according to the 2010 census, vanishing in 18 months without the world knowing or caring. Unfathomable would be the immediate reaction of any human being wrought with a conscience and love for mankind. And how ironic that we stand here today on this date, on November 16th, 88 years ago, which is the anniversary of the formal recognition of the Un Union of Soviet Socialist Republics by the United States of America. But slowly, and in measured steps, knowledge of the Holodomor has, become, has begun to disseminate throughout the world. The term itself, Holodomor, has now become a part of the American, if not world, lexicon. And since 2015, as mentioned by the ambassador and his grace, thousands of passers-by are now made more aware of Stalin's crime against humanity by visiting the Holodomor Memorial in Washington, D.C. But one of the greatest challenges facing greater awareness and genocide recognition of the Ukrainian Holodomor is the evil acts of Russian disinformation. Massive resistance and denial of the Holodomor were commonplace during Soviet times. A phrase in another major motion picture film of 2017 about the Holodomor named Bitter Harvest summarizes Moscow's intent regarding the Holodomor in one caption and in one scene of the film. Reality is the enemy. Our understanding of that stark reality is made all the more clear in viewing these original pieces of artwork that depict the Holodomor. We are thankful to Morgan Williams for providing this artwork, and as the old adage says, a picture is worth a thousand words. And now gives me great honor and pleasure to introduce Morgan Williams. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for attending this uh, exhibition uh, about the, uh, the Holodomor through the eyes of Ukrainian artists. We want to thank uh, Ambassador Oksana Markarova for a meeting that we had that she suggested that we have a Holodomor uh, event here at the Ukraine House. Uh, we want to thank uh, uh, the uh, Archbishop for being here and Michael Salkiew for all your work and you're basically responsible for the fact that there's a Holodomor monument over by Union Station. You worked for years to make that, uh, to, to make that happen. The exhibition today uh, is sponsored by the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council. Our council was started in 1995. We do have a program of honoring the culture, history, music, and the heritage of Ukraine. So this project is a part of our, our work uh, to promote the history and the culture of Ukraine. This project started in 1995 uh, when I realized that many, many, almost all of the photographs used by Ukrainians to show the famine in Ukraine who were taken on the Volga River in 1921 and 22. You've all talked about the great cover-up, one of the massive cover-ups of all history. Photographs were not allowed. There's just about, you know, 15 or 20, and they're really not 
very strong depictions of the people who died in the Hole in the Moor. So I got a hold of James Mace, the uh, noted Hole in the Moor scholar who was in Kiev. And I said, James, you used some of these Russian photographs in your exhibition at Harvard. He said, Morgan, we did all the research right, but we didn't have any photographs, so we used those Russian photographs, and we should not have done that. I said, well, what about photographs here? What about artists? It's normally the news media and the artistic community that calls such horrors to the attention of the politicians. He said, Morgan, you don't understand. If you wrote about it, if you sang about it, if you did a poem about it, if you did some artistic work, you weren't going to be around very well. You just weren't going to be around. It just wasn't allowed. He said, I can't hardly believe it, in a more of a massive cover-up for many, many, many years and what the Soviets uh, pulled on this. So, so, so James May said, well, maybe some artists after 1989, when the place opened up, maybe somebody did something about the Hole in the Moor. So we started looking. Uh, we found some, and we thought it would probably be poster artists. The Soviet Union had poster art schools. They had the best poster art propaganda poster artists in the whole world. They were really effective. You did these posters, you had all kinds of contests. They printed 50,000 of them, spread them all over the Soviet Union. So we found uh, some poster artists, and they said in 1999, the entire poster industry and the arts industry collapsed. We started having some of our own exhibitions. Artists started doing something about Chernobyl, destruction of culture, destruction of nature, and there are some about the whole the more. So we started going looking at them, and we found some, some of the best in the collection, and we bought those, and that started the search. For four years, we searched almost every art studio we could find. We did what you call massive uh, networking. Uh, we went from studio to studio almost every weekend. I would visit studios, and we would find some once in a while, we'd find some Holdemore art, and of course nobody bought Holdemore art, so it was always in the back of the, it was always in the back of the, uh, of the guy's studio, and uh, it was always so wonderful to listen to the stories, because maybe only five percent of the artists were willing to do anything about the Holdemore. It wasn't a subject they could sell on the Drisky Spoons. It wasn't something they were making a living out of. And we found that most all of them that painted these paintings, they did it out of their heart. They did it out of their soul because grandmother and grandfather died or they lost other relatives and they, they, when they were told about it. And most of them, all of them decided that they wanted to express through their artistic talents uh, what they heard and what they saw and uh, what to do. Because it's very, very, very uh, important as Michael said, to show these kind of disasters visually. Because, uh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. There were just none. So we started collecting them, and we found that uh, over time that we, uh, we did a good job. The first exhibition of all these uh, were done in uh, 19, 2000 in Kiev. Levko Lukyanko headed up the local Holomor group and he asked me to do an exhibition. We did one at the uh, Ukraine house. Four days after we did it at the Ukraine house, a bunch of union guys came in, saw it, demanded that the head of the Ukraine house take it down. They said, this didn't happen. This is an insult to the country. This is 2000 when this happened. And we had some of those ones with Stalin and his teeth, Stalin with the bones. They were outraged that we were showing those uh, kind of uh, uh, artwork. We did, when President Yushchenko became president, <coughs> for five years we did a major exhibition at the Ukraine house, and we, we had the whole Ukraine house full. We had about 250 of them there. And so uh, the search uh, uh, went on and on and on. And we'd like to say just a few things about some of the artists. Behind here are three paintings by Valery Vedder. Valery Vedder was a young uh, Soviet. All of these artists were trained in the Soviet Union. That's where I wanted them trained. I wanted them from Ukraine, from the heart of Ukraine, 
I want to buy Ukrainians for a little, very little of this one. Look at this. In the hands, he has kernels of wheat. And as they drop to the ground, they turn to skulls. You want to look at these paintings very carefully because the artist put a lot of subtle things into them. They put a lot of their heart and soul into them to try to find out what message were they, uh, were they trying to, uh, to uh, convey. Uh, one of the most famous, best guys I ever met was Mikola Bondarenko, uh, just a salt of the earth guy. He lived up in the Sumi. Somebody told me about him, so I went to Sumi to meet him. And he uh, was a wood, he's a little cut artist. And he did, he made his living doing book prints, book plates. And he said, Morgan, I wanted to do something about the Holodomor, so, and I and used my talents. And so most all these guys wanted to use their talents, wanted to use them to leave visually their perception of what happened. So he said, I came up with the idea, what did people eat? What did people find to eat in this massive struggle to stay alive? People were desperate, they were staying alive. He interviewed every one of them in his rayon, and every one of them that told him something they tried to eat, he made a, he made a wood cut. And they're all in a the, in the window, and they were put into a book. The first time we had an exhibition, and President Yushchenko came, we had McCullough come down and, and, and meet him, and the president gave him an award later. But this guy, he spent most of 19, uh, 1989, working on these uh, lentil cuts to show what people ate. To me, it would be a great book to use for children because children understand food. They understand hunger. They understand what it takes to eat. There are 75 artworks here on display. Uh, this is the first ever major showing of these artworks in the United States. The artworks will be available for use. We'll have them stored here in Washington. Anybody wants to use them and ship them uh, somewhere to use them, they're now available. Again, I'd just like to say that uh, thanks to James Mace, thanks to a lot of uh, friends in, in Kiev who uh, searched, we searched catalogs, we searched, we made phone calls. We think that we, uh, we purchased probably 90% of all the artworks done about the Holodomor in Kiev and in that area from 1989 to 1993 when the first exhibit was ever held. There's also one in there by Victor Symbol. Victor was a famous American uh, Ukrainian artist, very famous for his advertising. The first Holodomor exhibition in the, in the United States was done in 1993. 1993, a big commemoration in Chicago. He did a nine-foot painting of a mother going up in the heaven holding her baby. There's a small copy of it uh, in here. There's upstairs, there's also two German postcards. As I searched, the first ever visual th items I found about the Holodomor were two underground postcards by Ukrainian youth in Germany. They had these drawings, anti-Stalin. Uh, uh, there was still, of course, uh, some, t some uh, scaredness about passing those out. But they printed those to kind of cheap paper, but they, they printed them out on underground. So again, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to put this collection together. It's the only large collection in the world, and it's only for one purpose. That's to tell the story visually about the huge tragedy in Ukraine through the eyes of Ukrainian artists. We hope that you will take a look. We hope that you will look at them through the eyes of Ukrainian artists and about the horror and the destruction and the death that took place in Ukraine. Thank you very much.
Very impressive. Yes, I, I'm, I'm very impressed. I think it's a great, a remarkable effort by Morgan, um, who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. And uh, it's great that he got to do this some years ago and, and make it uh, possible to let people know what really happened there. Um, it is, uh, it's a remarkable thing. We, many people know about the, have heard of the uh, Armenian Genocide, oh, um, uh, obviously they know about the Holocaust, but not many Westerners uh, are that familiar, not Americans anyway, are very familiar with this issue and what happened back there. It's hard for them to believe. It is an, a critical role for us to keep alive uh, those that have died, that have starved, that have no voices. We are those voices, and we better be good voices. God made us to, to live. He instilled in us life. He gave us uh, land to grow, to, put, to, to, to have a bread on a table not to starve uh, each other. So, so it is, it is a, 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 a divine uh, obligation for us to, to keep those memories alive. We drove in from Philadelphia with my uh, sister-in-law her mother, Tatiana Polichka, was a witness to the Holodomor. So this has a special meaning for, for me, to my sister-in-law, to be here and to witness all these very tragic expressions through, through our Ukrainian artists. I was uh, active during the, uh, the 80s when the commission was formed and what our uh, group of uh, activists did in Philadelphia was try to get witnesses to come and testify. And it, was, uh, it wasn't an easy job to get them to testify because many said that they don't want to think about this, they don't want to remember, they don't want to talk about it. And it's, uh, we were very pleased to be able to find a few people that came and testified before Congress. And then when uh, Ukraine became independent, uh, the two volumes that were published of the witness testimony were brought to Ukraine so that uh, the government of Ukraine could have documentation of actual live witnesses and also that the general public could have access to this information. I am the daughter of a survivor of the Ukrainian famine. Uh, my mother was Tatiana Klimenko Pavlichka. Um, actually, she just passed away a month and a half ago. She was 99. Uh, she was a survivor of the, um, of the famine. And I remember sitting even at my grandparents, my grandmother's um, side and her telling me about the famine at a very young age before I could even begin to understand what had happened. Um, she would tell me about, my grandmother would tell me about cannibalism, which again, as a young child, I really couldn't comprehend that, that such a thing had happened. Um, my mother was 10 years old uh, when she, the famine, 1932-33. She would tell me stories of, of walking through the village and seeing people who didn't look like people that looked like chickens. Basically, their necks were thin and their faces were drawn. As a child, I remember asking her, uh, Mama, can, why did you not hide? Couldn't you hide food? Um, hide what you grew in, in the gardens, you know, far off? And she said no, because they would come to the house and to the land and start digging up anything that they had planted uh, or even hid. And if they did find stuff, the people were taken away and they were never seen again. It was, um, 
it was a, a very horrible time. She had cousins that, that died, uh, other cousins that were taken away that she never saw again. She, my grandparents, her mother and father, and um, two sisters, along with my mother, survived uh, to Austria. It was, it, it was a very difficult, horrific time for them. We are so overwhelmed by emotion that we are both moved to tears. I speak for mom as well as me. Uh, we were looking forward to this for a very long time, but once we stepped foot into this building, we went somewhere else. I'm not quite sure where. I don't want to cry. But we went somewhere else and we are experiencing a lot of emotion because um, my mom... I went through World War II. I saw all the destruction and things, and I, I've never seen something like that. I mean, it is, this is awful. The it art is beautiful, but it speaks too loud because it's so real yeah. that it speaks to your heart. And I'm sure I speak for all the guests today that uh, yeah. we will bring it home, you know, the memories will remain. And I applaud Morgan. Uh, he did a phenomenal job, Morgan Williams. I remember uh, hearing about this exhibition uh, when Morgan was first putting it together in Kiev and giving support for it, but I never saw it. And so to see all the artworks here today uh, is really amazing. Uh, from an artistic point of view, there, there's a lot of diversity in the, in the media and the expressions. And then, of course, uh, it speaks right to your soul, to your, to your subconscious. Uh, every, every Ukrainian, you know, feels this uh, genocidal tragedy. But to express it in, uh, in a visual art form uh, is really amazing. So I'm, uh, I will have to come back because you can spend uh, days here uh, looking at every uh, piece of art, looking at it in detail, and feeling something different. Uh, but again, we're very grateful to uh, Morgan and the Ukraine House uh, for putting this on. Thank you. Thank you.